well, first off, I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order. I want to welcome you to the January 12th, 2022 regular meeting of the governing board. I can't believe it's 2022 already. Um, Mrs. Knight, could you please do roll call? Barb Moskin. Here. Jason Olive. Jason Olive. Here. Laura Bruner. Here. Lindsay Love. Lindsay Love. Here. Here. Thank you, Mrs. Nye. Sorry. Would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and please remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Our first order of business uh, for this evening is the election of a board president for 2022. I will be um, passing the presiding officer um, duties to uh, Mr. Frank Narducci. Mr. Narducci. Thank you, Madam President, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Our first uh, order of business tonight is to election of the board president for the next term. And so I'd like to ask for nominations for the seat of board president for the 2022 um, term. So if there are any nominations on the floor. I move. Mr. Narducci, I would like to move to um, nominate uh, Mrs. Mawson as board president, please. Do we need a second? Okay, I haven't moved for Ms. Mosden to serve as a board president. Um, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, Mr. Worth, second. Um, are, are you willing to serve Madam President for another term? <laughs> uh, yeah, I will. You are? Yes. Um, are, if you're willing to do that, I'd like to call for a vote. And if you can state, so Donna has it clearly, to state your name and Mr. Worth? Yes. Mrs. Mosden, yes. Mrs. Bruner. Ms. Bruner? I thought we were going up there. Uh, Laura Bruner, yes. Oh, Ms. Love? Yes. And uh, Mr. Olive? Yes. Okay. Um, first, are there any other nominations? Or first nomination passes four to one. First time doing this, folks. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, passes four to one. Um, congratulations. Thank you. You are our board president. And so I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, to <laughs> elect you. the vice president. All right. Um, next, we have our election of our board vice president for 2022. Um, I, it is open for nomination. Do we have um, a nomination? I move Jason Olley for vice president. I will second. Mr. Olive, are you willing to serve as vice president for 2022? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, we will do a roll call vote then. Um, Mr. Worth? Yes. Myself? Yes. Mrs. Bruner? Yes. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Love? Yes. Mr. Olive? Yes. Okay, motion carries five to zero. Um, congratulations, uh, Mr. Olive, um, on being elected for board vice president for 2022. Next, we'll go to our um, Routine business and first is to approve the minutes of the December 8th, 2021 regular board meeting. Um, there have been no additions or corrections that I know of to the minutes. Um, so could we please get a motion to approve those? Madam President, I make a motion to approve the minutes 
Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes of the December 8th, 2021 regular board meeting as presented, please say aye. 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 Ms. Love, I didn't hear your vote. I said aye. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. Next, we have to approve and ratify our payroll and accounts payable vouchers. Um, could I get a motion, please? Madam President, I move to approve and ratify payroll and accounts payable vouchers. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve and ratify the payroll and accounts payable vouchers. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries five to zero. Mr. Narducci, is there any correspondence tonight? Madam President, there is no correspondence at this time. Thank you. Next, we'll get, we will be having um, um, reports from two of our student body presidents um, this evening, one from ACP High School and one from Basha High School. Hunter Bix um, from ACP High School is here to talk about what's going on at ACP. Hunter? Good evening, Madam President, board members, and Mr. Narducci, and thank you for having me again tonight, and Happy New Year. I'm Hunter Bickus. I'm the student body president of Arizona College Prep High School, and I'm excited to share with you all the happenings at ACP since my last visit in October. Our fall sports teams finished their seasons with impressive state tournament play. I'm excited to announce that we have our first individual diving state champion in school history, junior Addie Granger. We were honored to welcome Addie back to school with an assembly celebrating her accomplishment along with all of our fall sport athletes as they had amazing seasons. Speaking of sports, our winter sports teams are in action and having a very impressive season. Varsity boys basketball is off to an impressive start with a record of six and two. Senior captain Tyler Gebbing is leading the Knights with some spectac spectacular stats that led to two AZ Central articles detailing his first class performance on court all while battling an autoimmune disorder. Our girls basketball team is on a roll, winning four of their last five games, proving to have the fight of champions. Our wrestling teams are having a phenomenal season as the boys won a tournament earlier this season and our girls team finished first at their match last week. Girls soccer ended 2021 on a good note as they brought home the championship trophy from the ladies prospector gold cup tournament. And finally, our boys soccer team is proving to be a force in 3A winning yet again last night in front of a home crowd and improving their record to four and one. We continue to be proud of our night athletes and look forward to seeing how their winter seasons conclude. Our speech and debate team is busy preparing to defend their back-to-back -back state championship titles with their eye on getting the 3P at this year's state tournament. They have, a very, have had a very successful season thus far, winning several tournaments last quarter. We are excited to see if they will bring back the state trophy to ACP again this year. And our chess team fought hard in their state championship, finishing just one match shy of the winning state title. Our theater program had their first ever show in our school's auditorium with the production of Peter, Peter and the Star Catcher. The students did an amazing job on stage and behind the scenes, and I enjoyed watching them put, in, put on their first production while showcasing our auditorium. The musical and acting talents of my fellow knights is incredible, and it was awesome to see how many new faces were on stage. In addition, our band and orchestra musicians performed their first concerts in our new auditorium, putting on a wonderful winter concert for students and their families to enjoy. It is great to see our performing arts students showcase their talents on our new school stage. In other news, a group of 13 Knights participated in the State Space Visions Conference in Houston, Texas, as members of the Students of Exploration and Development of Space, or SEDS Club. This conference held multiple professionals from the space industry giving lectures, discussions, and workshops for future space enthusiasts. Information about astrophysics, space medicine, space policy, the Artemis Project, and inclusivity was presented. ACP High School was one of only five schools in the entire nation who received this opportunity as part of the SEDS program. At the start of our second quarter, our DECA students opened up the much anticipated student store, which they nicknamed the Midnight Snack. <laughs> it, is a it is definitely a popular stop for students as they head to lunch or to other activities, and the DECA students are doing a great job of managing and marketing the store. So if you ever find yourself at ACP and are a little hungry or need a pen or pencil, just stop by the Midnight Snack and our DECA will be happy to serve you. We had an exciting day in November as we welcomed eighth graders from ACP Middle School, 
Santan and Payne Junior High School, who will soon become fellow Knights at ACP High School. Our student government, along with administration, planned a fun-filled day for the students that included an assembly, tours around campus showcasing various classes and CTE offerings, and of course we had to perform a skit to show off the true spirit of being a knight. During the visit, our future knights were partnered with high school mentors who answered questions, guided the tours, joined them for lunch, and helped them experience ACP firsthand. It was a great day and it was fun to interact with the eighth grade students as they, and witness their excitement as they begin to prepare themselves for the high school experience. As a school, we strive to make a positive impact on our community and as a student body, we completed over 4,300 hours of community service last semester, which had an impact of a value of over $110,000. For example, our National Honor Society partnered with our Project Impact Community Service Club to host an extremely successful clothing drive for Chandler Clothes Cabin. Our student body brought in hundreds of art articles of clothing to give to those in need in our surrounding community. Philanthropy is a value that we strive for all nights to possess, so this was a great drive and saw a great amount of participation from our student body and staff. Student government was busy as ever as we worked to provide the student body with a fun-filled semester and a plethora of second quarter events. We began the quarter with our homecoming week game and dance and ended the quarter with our annual winter formal. Students enjoyed both events having fun with their friends while showing off their best dance moves. We all agree that the new campus is a fantastic place to host events and have really enjoyed learning how to use our new space. As the semester came to a close, Stugo tried to alleviate some of the end of the semester stress that students have preparing for finals by handing out hot chocolate and gathering as a student body in our courtyard to engage in a pre-final scream. Students could scream away their stress while having some fun with their peers before winter break started. It was a unique but fun way to get the stress out and it was quite the sight to hear and see. As we move into the second semester, we are looking forward to the many fun events and good times that are coming to ACP. We are back and ready to strive for the impossible and be extraordinary like we do every day at ACP. I thank you so much for your time tonight and all you do for ACP and CUSD to make it the best place for students. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you coming tonight and letting us know all the things that were going on at ACP. It's a busy place over there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, next, we will have Cole Del Monte from Basha High School. Tell us what's going on at Basha High. All right. Good evening. Thank you for having me this time. Got the presentation all queued up here. <laughs> for those of us who were here last time and saw me struggle up here trying to get it all ready. All right, let me just get it. Oh, spoke too soon. There? Yeah. More of a Google Slides person. <laughs> all right, so. Thank you all for having me, and I just want to say before I start that um, I know it was hard for a lot of us to transition from like to online and then back, so I just want to, I hope this presentation can kind of provide insight and just have everyone in this room and everyone watching kind of look back and appreciate how much work was put into it and just this, these are the fruits of our labors, and it really, you can really tell the impact that having these in-person events and all these things in person that has on our students, staff, and community members. So I'm just gonna go through some of the events that we had in the second semester. So our winter sports assembly was on November 19th, and personally, this is one of my favorite events, and I talked about this last time with our fall sports assembly. Walking out during an assembly is my favorite high school memory by far. You can see, actually, yeah, you can't see me right there. The individual backflipping right there um, behind him, there's, there I am. So this was my senior assembly for soccer. So walking out was super awesome. And you can see um, all the different sports run out onto the field and they have their different unique things and it's just super cool. The girls soccer team, one of them, they all lined up in like a triangle and then one of them like spun like a bowling ball and everyone fell down. It's just super cool. And something that has continued through kind of a COVID year where unique walkouts just stayed strong. Can't stop that. Our theme was Candyland, and you, we have some Stugo members here. Um, 
dressed up according to theme. Last time I was in this presentation a lot. I think this is my only picture, but I could be wrong, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, we had to welcome back our Arizona State Championship winning girls wrestling program, who won last year as the first girls wrestling state champions, so that was awesome. Gave them a little shout out there. Um, and we have to give credit here to Olivia Salcido, who took these pictures and is the yearbook co-editor-in-chief. Movie on the Lawn was up next. So we, this was something that we started last year as a way to really social distance. And it's kind of a tradition that has kind of carried on. As you can see, not as much social distancing <laughs> here in these pictures. But it was just a good way. Obviously, it was a little chilly, so everyone was kind of wrapped up. But it was a great way to just enjoy um, Enjoy the holiday season. We watched Elf. Um, this is not the whole crowd. Don't worry. This is just the front people, and there's a lot of studio members up here. Uh, we watched Elf, and yeah, this is, and I'll talk about this at the end, but this is kind of part of our community involvement goals. This event was open to the public, and we had a lot of little kids and teachers. Like, my English teacher came with her children, and it was just a cool, like, batch of community moment. Um, we had our gingerbread competition, which these pictures are funny and do not highlight the insane creativity of some people. I saw, I literally, we allowed students to bring supplies from their house to make these gingerbread houses, and some people took that to a level that I was not expecting. We had like bridges and canals and tents. It was an insane gingerbread competition, and um, it's honestly one of my favorite things that we started last year and have continued into this year. And it's a good way that we can kind of social distance and you can like stay in your group. But it's competitive and it's fun. And I mean, we see here a little destroyed one, but there were insane ones. And I, I was just so, it was so cool to be there and experience that. De-stress fest. So I know ACP had something similar to this. This was something that we started this year. We had different activities the week before finals where students could just relax and enjoy themselves. We had, you can see the flyer up there, we had Monday jazz band played in the cafeteria. So that's, that was a cool way that we can incorporate other things on campus and other groups, not just um, Stugo ourselves. And then Tuesday we had a petting zoo and we love working with that petting zoo. <laughs> we have it all the time and the students love the petting zoo. It was right outside the lunchroom. Um, so students could just go and pet the animals and Wednesday, we had our own homemade stress balls, which is a great way to reuse some balloons that you did not use from past assemblies. <laughs> we picked up some flowers, and students could just make their own stress balls and um, you know, get their stress out. Definitely saw some broken ones, so people were really stressed, I guess. <laughs> On Thursday, we had Just Dance set up so people could just go dance at Basha, which is unique, <laughs> I would say. And then Friday, definitely by far my favorite day. We had these super cute puppies, which I included more than any other day because they're more interesting to look at than the <laughs> balloons, I would say. And so it, there was like masses around these puppies just getting to pet them before your lunch was over. So that was really cool. And this is, a, this is the first time we've done this and probably my favorite thing that we've done, um, favorite like new thing that we've done all year. Um, yeah, so upcoming, I didn't include this in the PowerPoint because it was this morning, but we had our um, CUSD, we hosted the special education Christmas party, or it is January um, because the buses got mixed up. So it was the winter wonderland party um, this year and it was so fun. It's honestly like, it's so memorable. All the students are there. We had coloring, we had different toys, we had a dance floor, which was definitely being hit by everyone. There was lots of dancing going on. In fact, for Stugo members, you had to have minimum two songs on the dance floor for your participation points. So there was lots of dancing going on. We had, um, we had lots of food and snacks, and we hosted um, all the CUSD schools, special education programs in our gym, and just had a winter wonderland. It was super awesome. So that's not really upcoming, but upcoming at the time that I made this presentation. Um, we have, and I'll talk about some of these events in a second, how, how they kind of go towards the Basha culture and how we operate according to our goals that we have. Um, coming up soon is our dodgeball tournament. So this is going to be, I mean, I think it's going to be fun. I'll definitely be participating. There's going to be boys bracket and girls bracket. We're just going to fight it out, you know, play some good dodgeball. I find that I have not actually played dodgeball in high school, which makes all those high school movies pretty 
fake because I feel like dodgeball was a pretty big part of PE and high school curriculum, and I have yet to play, so excited to <laughs> get that done my senior year. We have our Sadie Hawkins dance coming up, which is Spash's first winter formal, at least since I have been there, and it has definitely been a requested thing, so we're going to make the most of that one. Girls get the turn this time to ask. Um, we have our Mr. BHS pageant coming up, which is also a first thing, so each club is going to send a representative, and they're going to have like a Miss USA kind of fight, not physically. Um, ask questions, you know, I think there's like a suit competition and stuff like that, so that's going to be super cool and another way that we involve our clubs and just kind of get full campus participation. Uh, we have our Bashapalooza coming up, which was something that we, the last Bashapalooza we had was the last day, the last normal day of school. Um, we went to fall break after Bashapalooza and then never came back, so this is going to be good to kind of reinvent and kind of like get the cap end of that. Um, we have our spring sports assembly coming up, which you guys know I love, I love the sports assembly, so get to highlight our spring sports coming up. Talking about the goals we have, and as you can see, these are similar to the ones I did last time. That's not because I'm lazy. These are just our ongoing goals that we like to continue to include. So inclusivity, um, we, a, th a thing that Bash Studio strives to have is adapted opportunities for our special needs community. Last quarter, we had um, our adapted booth at our homecoming carnival, and this this quarter we we partnered with a local nonprofit, Believe Beyond Ability, and we had some toys that they could um, the kids with whatever mobility, so whatever whatever body part they could use, whatever whatever they had to participate, they could hit a switch and watch their toy go, which is a unique opportunity. And the fact that we got to do that for all COSD students was um, awesome, and the kids had a super fun time with that. A so the next two parts of inclusivity kind of go together, but they are different. Some students do not want to put in the work to be at all these events. Like, we have a lot, and some people just don't have that extra effort, which is fine. So we like to do full campus events like our Distress Fest and our assemblies where it's just a part of their day-to-day -day thing. Like, they just go to class, and they're like, oh, we got to go to the assembly now. And then they end up having fun. So it's like a cool way that we can include everyone without, without uh, like relying on people's like go getterness. <laughs> I don't think that's a word, but <laughs> um, so yeah, our distress fest and assemblies like that. And then the different types of events. I know that not every student is either COVID comfortable or just having a super fun time at an event like homecoming. So we have we have dances coming up like our Sadie Hawkins. But for our athletes, we also have dodgeball and just. We also have relaxing events like Movie on the Lawn. So whatever your specific interests are and specific just things that you enjoy, you can find an event or some activity at BASHA that will fit that. And then our community involvement and appreciation, which is my last point, the winter party we partnered with our local nonprofit. I also don't have up here, but I said it during the, excuse me, during the, um, during the Movie on the Lawn that, that was open to the public. So. And we had food trucks there, so just the the more that Basha can, uh, like, be with the community, the more that helps all of us return from COVID and just have a more like just the Chandler community can grow stronger and be a better place. So, uh, thank you guys for having me tonight, and yeah, look forward to presenting next time. Thank you, Cole. A lot is going on at Basha too. We appreciate your presentation. So, we will now move on to our athletic state champions and some recognition for them. Mr. Thank Locke. You. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Would the board like to join in? We have pins for all of our uh, state champions today. You'll come join me on the floor. Let's bring in the Castile High School girls cross country team. Come on in. <laughs> Well, we have a number of special recognition items tonight. Our high school athletic teams continue to distinguish themselves. At our last board meeting, we recognized three schools for winning state championships. They were Perry High School's badminton team, Hamilton's boys golf, and girls volleyball teams. Tonight, we'd like to recognize another team that brought home a winning trophy, that's Castile High School's girls cross country team. This was especially significant because the Colts won their first title 
could still finish with 70 points to easily defeat second place Flagstaff, which had 94. Now, now you're thinking, 70 points is fewer than 94, but cross country is kind of like golf. The fewer points you get, the better off you are. Um, senior Jaden Heron Jonah blood the pack by finishing in fourth place, and the team title was testimony to the team's depth as Castile snapped Flagstaff's reign as six-time defending Division II champion. <laughs> Congratulations, girls, and Coach Whitney Lemieux. Thank you, girls. Great. Now, Mr. James, would you send in all the individual champions from the uh, first semester? Come on in. Everybody, come on in. Okay, now we'd like to uh, bring in all these student athletes who won individual state titles. We'd like to invite them all in now. First to the audience is far left is Samaya Bodinker. Samaya is the state division one singles champion in badminton. Samaya only a sophomore. She won three matches at state, including a come from behind 19 to 21 loss, of course, and then 21 to 13, she kept getting stronger and stronger, and then 21 to eight victory over Marilyn Lee of Corona del Sol. Congratulations. <laughs> Next to your left is uh, Jenny Seal. She is uh, the Division I girls golf medalist. Jenny shot rounds of 64 and 70 for a total of 134 at the Tucson National Golf Course. Now those are nine hole scores for people like me, so imagine doing that in 18. Um, Jenny led the Huskies to a third place finish in the team standings. Now we're gonna <laughs> now move on to the swimming and diving champions. First is Audrey Pickles. Audrey, are you here? Is Audrey here? Yes, she's here. Uh, Audrey won something of a marathon in this sport, winning the uh, first place in a 500 yard freestyle. That's a long race. She swam the distance in four minutes, 58.48 seconds, five seconds ahead of the second place competitor, Mary Jane Nielsen of Horizon. Audrey is a sophomore, so she has two more chances. <laughs> Next, they see Amaya Wiley of Perry High School. She's a senior, and she won the Division I one-meter diving title, finishing in a tie with McKenna Stalker of Chaparral High with final scores, of, believe it or not, of 453.55. That was a tie with that number, but congratulations on your state title. <clears throat> I don't see Brecken Scroggin Castile here today, but she uh, is the Division II uh, one meter diving champion, and her score beat uh, uh, Madeline Narada of Paradise Valley, who sported uh, about 30 points lower. And uh, Brecken's going to graduate this year as a two time champion. Next is sophomore August Vetch, also from Castile High School. Um, he is uh, our Division II champion in the 100 yard butterfly event. That's a tough, that's a tough sport. Uh, <laughs> But listen to this, so after he had a third, the third fastest time in the preliminaries, he reached another year. He reached back and clocked a 49.36 in the finals to beat uh, writer Androsky of Gilbert, who posted 50 seconds and .3. So uh, kind of a unexpected coming out of the primary, uh, uh, preliminaries to win the title. We're real proud of you. Very nice. <laughs> Not here tonight is senior Evan Nail of Perry High School. He's the Division I boys. 200 yard individual medley, medley winner and sophomore Addie Granger, who we heard from or heard about earlier today from ACP, she won the Division Three girls girls one meter diving title. So congratulations again to all these individual state champions. Congratulations, y'all. Okay, we want to have the board stay where you are. 
Mr. Narducci, too, if you would. This is the district recognition. Uh, January is the school board recognition month. As elected officials who serve students and representatives from their community, unpaid, I might add, this is our opportunity to say thank you for your dedication to our district and our community. We see the school board in action at meetings once or twice a month, but also are, are also aware that all you do when you're not behind the dais. This includes all the research, visibility at our school, and leadership in our community. Now, we think we have the ultimate honor for you. Forbes magazine named Chandler Unified the best employer in Arizona. This recognition is not just for education, but for all businesses in the state. We know we have some real heavyweights in Arizona and Chandler alone, for that matter. So CUSD is the only K-12 district to crack the top 40 in this year's ranking and earn the number one spot. <laughs> to determine the list, 80,000 Americans working for businesses with at least 500 employees were surveyed. All the surveys were anonymous, allowing participants to openly share their opinions. The respondents were asked to rate their employers on a variety of criteria, including safety of work environment, competitiveness of, of compensation, and opportunities for advancement. A statista then asked respondents how likely they'd be to recommend their employer to others and to nominate another organization in their industry outside of their own if they'd like. Uh, the number of businesses ranked in each state was dependent on two factors, the, the number of qualifying employers and the uh, employees and the size of the state's workforce. And those with operations in more than one state had the opportunity to be listed in multiple times. The final list ranks the top 1,328 employers across the nation that received the greatest number of recommendations in each of our 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia. Thank you, Governing Board. Your leadership helped CUSD be named number one in Arizona. We have certificates for you. And if the board would like to have those framed, we'd love to do that for you. Thank you. That concludes our recognition. Oh. Wait for you. It's been all over. It's been great. He's a first bad. Thank you. Um, and next, we will go on to citizen comments. And uh, Mr. Locke, could you go ahead and start us off with the um, online comments, please? Well, thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and Superintendent Arducci. As a courtesy, we provide an opportunity for the public to submit citizen comments electronically on any topic. We've heard from 14 people since our last board meeting in early December. Our feedback centered on four topics this time, equity, Number two, uh, health and safety, mask and mitigation strategies. Three is board meetings. And number four, curriculum and instructional programs. Submitting comments electronically provides our governing board members time to read and prepare prior to our meetings. The format also provides the board an opportunity to ask clarifying questions to the administration. You have the submissions verbatim for your consideration. They're also available on our website for public review. Thank you, Mr. Locke. And now um, it's time for our in-person citizen comments. Um, members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38431.01H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to review the matter, responding to any criticism or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. Mr. Vaught, could you introduce our, our citizens for I tonight? Sure, I sure will. Now, during public comments, members of the governing board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda pursuant to Arizona revised statute. Uh, action taken as a result of public comments is limited to directing staff to review the matter, responding to criticism, or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. The board president reserves a right to ensure the speakers present on topic, present on topics that are within the board's jurisdiction, and everyone is asked to present their comments in a respectable and courteous manner. Profanity or threats of harm will not be tolerated. Our first speaker is Toria Hale of Chandler, going to speak to us about COVID protocol. And you have um, three minutes for this evening. Hi, my name is Toria Hale, and I spoke at the last board meeting regarding the COVID protocol. 
I would like to thank the district for making the change to where students who come in contact with a positive COVID student only need to wear a mask for 10 days. That will help students not lose valuable class time. It is also a step in the right direction. I would like to thank Mr. Narducci for taking my phone call last month and having a great discussion. I also would like to take this time to urge students and parents to be kind and patient to our bus drivers while they go through this stressful time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kurt Roars from Chandler to speak about curriculum. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kurt Roars. I'm a parent in this district. I have some comments regarding a new proposed curriculum for the district. Last meeting, we heard a proposed new curriculum for the district called Windows and Mirrors. It's proposed by a biased political special interest group and organized by the teachers union. It appears to have a decidedly biased approach in this presentation. The core premise is that CUSD teachers are not capable of teaching kids with different ethnicities of their, than their own. Our teachers are presumed to not be culturally competent because of what they look like. Does this imply that white teachers cannot teach black kids? That Latino teachers cannot teach Asian kids? That female teachers cannot teach male kids? That skinny teachers cannot teach heavy kids? This is absurd. It is not really worthy of serious consideration. I would suggest the district should have more faith in the experienced teachers that it employs. The teachers union should be questioned in their attempt to throw their own teachers under the bus in order to advance another woke political agenda. We are a diverse community, and we do take pride in that. But diversity does not mean division. Diversity does not mean discrimination. Diversity does not mean segregation or separatism. These concepts were rejected decades ago in this country. The people that need to resurrect them should be rejected as well. We will be one people. Diversity of perspective without a commonality of purpose is non-productive. The commonality of purpose is that we teach our kids to read. Implicitly biased curriculum proposals such as this are inappropriate and unnecessary distractions that should be set aside. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam President. Yes, Mr. Nakuchi. Thank you, Mr. Roars. I just I know that I can speak yes. when there's something that may be incorrect. We do not have a curriculum called Windows and Mirrors. I just want to go for record to let you know that. We do we do look at Windows and Mirrors as a process so that all kids can see in others what they are in themselves. So if we have students that are culturally different, we, they should see staff that's culturally different. They should be able to read books in the library that are written by culturally different authors. And they should also be able to see pictures and books and things of that that represent their families and th their cultures. And so by windows and mirrors, it's a, it's a terminology that's used that they can see themselves through others and they can see themselves in the community that they're learning. Uh, there's not a curriculum called Windows and Mirrors. There hasn't been one. If there was, it would be vetted here and it would be discussed here prior. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to go on record to let you know that when things like this are brought up, we are going to respond. And uh, this is the time that we do it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Constant uh, Lapujati. Can we get it right this year, this week? Close? Close? OK, good. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Um, at the last meeting, there was a parent, and I'm a parent here too, who brought this book in. It feels good to be yourself. And she was saying how kind of awful it was. So I was really curious. So I went to my library, and I got the book. And I read the book. And the book is pretty amazing, actually. It's well written. There's nothing like sexual. There's nothing icky. or It's a, it's a beautiful book. And um, I think that perhaps, maybe if I do this, it might be easier. Some people don't understand about, um, and I can't claim that I can understand it completely either, but I can read numbers, I can read statistics. 16.6% um, of the LGBTQ youth had a high, have a higher risk of suicidal planning than 5% five, four, 5 of straight adolescents. They also found that 12% of the LGBTQ young people had a higher risk of suicide attempts compared to 5% of heterosexual teens. The younger the respondents, 
the greater the concerns. Those younger, um, those younger than age 15 had riskier suicidal behaviors than people 15 years and older. That should be concerning. It should, um, the LGB youth had a faster progression from having suicide ideation to making a suicide plan than their heterosexual peers. When only one in three LGBTQ youth reported that their home was, was safe and affirming for them, one in three. Additionally, um, in a study, 75% of LGBTQ youth reported that they had experienced discrimination based on their sexual orientation or gender identity at least once in their lifetime, and more than half said that they experienced the discrimination in the past year. We're talking about young kids, that they're dealing with this. Those who experienced discrimination in the past year attempted suicide at more than twice the rate of those who did not. And just so you know that in the short time I've been up here, there's already been children that are attempting suicide right now. That's happening. 30 That's seconds. happening. LGBTQ youth are more likely than heterosexual peers to be depressed because they are, on average, less satisfied in their family and to experience more bullying at school and in social media. LGBT youth younger than age 15 not only have to navigate developmental challenges that are common to teenagers, but they also have to try to figure out why they are different to manage that stress related to being a minority. Time has expired. Thank Next you very is much. Brandy Reese of Gilbert to speak about mitigation. Good evening. Um, to just dovetail on what she said, um, I learned today that uh, one of the LGBTQ clubs on campus at Perry had some sort of issue uh, with. Um, one of their meetings being cut short because of some material that was being presented and one of the faculty sponsors was maybe uncomfortable with it because they were requiring parent permission to attend that club. And um, as she said, one in three LGBTQ members don't have a supportive household for that sort of environment and requiring parental permission for that sort of club um, is n not very supportive to that group if, if that's an issue for them. Anyway, so most of us would like to see our students in person in the classroom. You've heard several students tonight echo that sentiment. Um, however, nearly every day I get an email notification from the school of an exposure or that the school is desperately seeking substitutes and bus drivers. Unfortunately, this has happened because certain politicians and media talking heads, and we've seen them here, have driven the narrative that has deprived our public schools of the resources they need to maintain a safe learning environment during an airborne pandemic. We need proper ventilation and air filtration to keep these spaces as safe as possible for our children, as well as the teachers, the staff, and the bus drivers who are the ones suffering the consequences of these political games. By uniting to demand proper safeguards like N95 masks and KN95 masks and 94 masks for our kids and something called the Corsi Rosenthal boxes that are being made homemade DIY and brought in by people, we can support our schools, our staff, we can prevent illness, we can save lives, and we can ensure that the kids are in the classrooms and that they're being taught by certified teachers and not scrambling around for substitutes. Um, and we can ensure a better, brighter tomorrow for all of our children without exceptions. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ann Adams of Chandler to speak of the curriculum. Hi, my name is Ann Adams and I'm a parent who has two teenagers at Hamilton High School. One of them's homeschooled and one of them's um, still in regular school. Uh, Laura Bruner, I'd like to start by 
by complimenting you as respecting the community when and when you took your oath of office because whenever we make a big decision like hiring someone I feel like the community needs to be involved I totally support Mr. Narducci but I would have liked to have been part of that conversation um, in the event that there are positions such as superintendent or other other positions in the future I'd like as a community member to be involved in that and be a part of that I love you I think you do a great job but I would have liked to have been part of that decision as a community member so um, when it comes to curriculum, uh, I, I only had a minute to speak last time, but I went to the curriculum office and I found a teacher's manual and we've been told by you, a couple of your board members have said this stuff doesn't exist and it does and it's been completely noted. I would love for Mr. Narducci to please look further into my complaint. Um, in the teacher's manual, Caring School Community, it talks about eliminating disparities in educational outcomes, which is totally impossible. Um, each child is motivated differently, regardless of, of skin color. So, you know, a white kid can be poor just as easily as a kid that has color in their skin. Um, and then it talks about the school to prison pipeline for mostly Af um, African American and Latino kids. And if that was my kid, I'd be very upset that that messaging was put in his ear. It's so negative. We need positive messaging to our kids that's not going to inspire them to be better. Um, rather than being coerced into compliance was one of the notes on, in this particular book. I can't understand what that means. It, it talks about um, maybe equaling the playing field when it comes to punishment, but if one kid throws something at another kid's head, I don't care what skin color they have, they both should have the same punishment in my, my mind. Um, so the message is given that skin color leads to prison, eliminate disparity in educational outcomes, what is that, dumbing down our education system, and um, discussions of coercion into compliance but from punishment. I don't understand these messages, and the only response I got from Jessica from curriculum was teachers are not teaching this, but it's their teacher's manual, so it's their game plan. So why is it in our curriculum library? That should be removed. I, I don't see anybody of any color or any sexual background or any background at all that would approve of any of these negative messages. Thank you very much for listening. Thank Next you. This is Katie Nash of Gilbert to speak about COVID. Good evening. I wanted to paint a picture of the grim reality of our schools right now. Over the past week and a half, we've had classroom absence rates as high as 30 plus percent. We've had over 40 staff absences at some of our high schools. We are being tasked with the impossible, trying to maintain some sort of normalcy for our students amidst a raging pandemic that is hitting our schools hard. We've seen bus drivers have to condense routes or double up. We've had district admin, even our folks up here, subbing in our classrooms. Everyone is doing all that they can to keep our students learning in person, but it is no longer being done safely. The most recent changes to our quarantine guidelines have made it incredibly difficult to know who is supposed to be wearing a mask and for how long. There are literally paragraphs that one has to read to determine whether a student should or should not be masked in the classroom. We've had COVID positive kids returning to campus without masks. Students with symptoms are coming to school untested and parents knowingly sending them. And it's all too much. We're asking that we please revisit the quarantine guidelines with input from our district COVID committee and the Chandler Education Association. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes tonight's comments. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Thank you to everyone who came this evening um, to speak with us. We appreciate it. Um, and we will now move on to our consent agenda. Mr. Narducci. Madam President, members of the board, um, on the consent agenda tonight, we first start out with the out-of-state um, student travel uh, pre-planning, um, out-of-state field trip pre-planning forms for uh, Castile High School, Hamilton High School, and Perry High School are provided. 
Following governing board uh, pre-approval, um, Dr. Gilbert will monitor the trip arrangements before providing final approval. Uh, the governing board will receive a summary of the final travel arrangements quarterly. Uh, final trip approval will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis and will be contingent upon current health guidelines in the, in the location the students are, are going to. to. Also, we have um, monetary gifts and donations. Uh, request approval for of the monetary gifts generously donated to Chandler Schools, totaling $145,181.52. And donations, uh, we request the approval of the items uh, donated to Chandler Schools, totaling $38,128.53. New for us is a de device protection plan. These are computer devices. Uh, this is a fee for Chandler High School um, student computers through our partnership with Dell and Intel. We heard about that partnership earlier in the year. And um, so as they're getting ready to activate and plan, um, we're, we're a part of this one-to-one -one technology in initiative between Chandler High and Dell and Intel and uh, provided Chandler High School student computers parents have the option to enroll in the device protection plan or the DPP. The enrollment in the plan will minimize the potential repair and or replacement fees associated with the device. Intentional damage to the device is not covered under the plan. The cost of the plan is $25. If the student does not file a claim or damage during the current school year, this fee will roll over to upcoming school years and their device will remain covered under the DPP uh, until the student is no longer a COST student or they have a claim. Enrollment in this plan includes accidental damage such as a cracked screen or a broken keyboard, uh, battery replacement if it's determined that the battery is malfunctioning, hardware issues and replacement of, the stolen device, this, of a stolen device with official police report. A police report must be filed within 48 hours, and a copy must be sent to the, to the school office. A lost device and intentionally damaged to a device and or AC adapters are not covered under the plan. Parents and students who choose not to purchase the DPP are responsible for all repairs and replacement of costs unless it's due to a manufacturer issue. Recommend approval of the optional $25 device protection fee. So it's something we're providing our families, but it is optional. Uh, 6.05 is a, uh, a mem mem memorandum of understanding between Desert Schools Performing Arts. Uh, this, we recommend approval of the mem memorandum of understanding or an MOU between Desert Sounds Performing Arts Incorporated and the Chandler Unified School District for the 22-23 school year. Uh, this collaboration brings um, Mariachi Club to San Marcos uh, students, and it's a very high, it's a highly regarded and quality extracurricular musical experience for our students at San Marcos. 6.06 is uh, in regards to bid number 78-22-22, which is white copy paper warehouse stock. Now, we had a few former board members that were really interested in this item. I hope you all as just as interested as they. Um, bid 28.22-22 was solicited from suppliers to provide pricing for 8 by 5 by 11 number 20 92 bright white copy paper. Seven vendors responded, and the recap of the solicitation has been provided in this agenda item. The district rec recommends approval of the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, uh, which is Staples, to provide 8,400 cases of white copy paper at $30.99 per case. The total amount, including tax, is $283,223.81. Due to supply chain issues and manufacturers closing from COVID-19, there has been an increase in pricing and difficulty for vendors being able to hold their pricing for a long period of time in comparison to prior years. So we have to act upon these things quickly. Also under 6.07, another memorandum of understanding between Make Way for Books. You may have remembered the presentation we had um, for the early childhood literacy programs at, at San Marcos. Uh, we recommend approval of the Mem Memorandum of Understanding MOU between Make Way for Books um, and the Chandler Unified School District for the 21-22 school year to implement a neighborhood school readiness project for San Marcos Elementary School. This project will provide opportunities for children to enter school ready 
to read and success by providing um, co comprehensive early literacy programming for families and children ages birth through five. The collaboration between Make Way for Books and San Marcos Elementary School will engage and empower families and develop children's emergent literacy skills. The MOU is effective July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 and is renewable for up to three years ending June 30th, 2024. Uh, that's also in collaboration with Reed on Chandler and Joanne Floth. And our last consent agenda item is human resources. We just recommend the employment separation and compensation agreements that have been provided for you. Thank you, Mr. Narducci. Could I please get a motion to approve our consent agenda? Madam President, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Jason, are you still there? Aye. Yes, I said aye. Okay, thank you. It didn't come through here. All right, uh, the motion carries. Next, we will go on to our action items. And the first one is our, uh, our chillers for Hamilton High School. Mr. Fletcher. I Madam President, members of the board, Hamilton High School opened in 1998. There are three chillers which are original. As you are aware, chiller number two failed this past May and is scheduled to be replaced by the school facilities board. The district believes it's a best practice to replace chillers one and three at the same time, which will ensure no interruption of service and maintain consistent climate control for students and staff. The district proposes to use MCOR services for this project. The cost to replace the two chillers is $610,960. We would use an Arizona state contract which complies with all school procurement rules. The district, oh wow, I'm sorry about that. We recommend approval of MCOR services for the replacement of Hamilton High School, high school chillers one and three in the amount of $610,960. Thank you. Could I please get a motion? Sorry, Madam President, I make a motion to approve MCOR services for the replacement of the two chillers at Hamilton High School in the amount of six hundred ten thousand nine hundred or sorry, six hundred ten thousand nine hundred sixty dollars. I'll second that. All right. Is there any clarify it's three chillers? I'm sorry. It's two chillers. Two. Oh, two chillers. Yeah. It, has two it is two chillers. Oh, it's for two. The school facility. The third one is going to be a, a separate thing that just gets school facility board, and we don't pass that one. We don't have to do that. Okay. No. Okay. Do I need to amend it? Sorry. For two chillers. Did you say two or three? I said two. Then that is correct. Okay. Okay, sorry, I was just reading it as it was on the board doc. Perfect. Are there any questions for um, Mr. Fletcher? Obviously, one of them was <laughs> replacing its three, but I the just district clarify is... Before we started talking about it, if that was the case, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a couple. Um, so the school facilities board will not replace until something fails, is that correct? That is correct. And what are we doing about the failed one right now? Do we have a temporary unit in there? We released the temporary unit, the 500 ton temporary unit in December because of the weather. So okay. we no longer need all three chillers to run. Okay. And so how soon would this be done? That I don't have an answer to yet. I'm guessing we're going to be about 30 weeks out. 30 through zero. Correct. Okay. And we're hoping that the others will survive until? We're doing everything we can to maintain them. As we get into the hot months, we will have a temporary chiller on reserve. So if we do lose one, then we'll be able to roll it out and hook it up just like we did in May. Okay. The other question I have is, do these three chillers serve the entire campus? or only parts of it? They serve the entire main campus. So not the, the... wings, not the athletic buildings. Okay. Those are all package units. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? I just, 
was hoping you could um, verify the source of the funding, what pot that comes out of, Ms. Barry or Mr. Fletcher. 2019 bond. Ms. Love, do you have any questions? I do not, um, but I want to say that I'm having some technical difficulties and my screen went out, so I just want you to know that in case we read the next action item, I can't read it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Olive, um, do you have any questions? Um, I already asked most of my questions uh, to Frank and to other, other folks that um, have to do with HVAC stuff, but uh, Frank, I, d I didn't realize before that uh, 30 weeks was the schedule. Is it you're going to be in the Ju July and August? That's what it appears like right now, Mr. Olive. We are trying to do everything we can to expedite all the chiller projects that we have going. We have one going at Bologna. We have one going at Tarwater. Now we'll have one at Hamilton, and then if the board approves the next item, we'll have one going at Hull. So we are concerned with supply chain. We are concerned with availability. So we're just trying to manage it as best we can with what we have right now. Do you have a Do you have a temporary chiller for Hamilton on on reserve in case you need it? We will be pursuing that as we get into the hotter months. As of right now, we don't need all three chillers. Okay. Great. If there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and, and vote on this item. All those in favor of approving MCOR services for the replacement of the two chillers at um, Hamilton High School in the amount of $610,960, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries. Next, we will talk about the Hull Elementary chillers. Mr. Fletcher. Exciting evening. Madam President, members of the board, Hull Elementary opened in 2000. There are four air-cooled chillers at this site, which are now 22 years old and at the end of their useful life. One of the chillers has currently failed. We are working with the school facilities board to replace that chiller. While this work is proceeding, the district recommends that we replace the other three chillers at the same time. There are concerns regarding parts availability, etc. Replacing all chillers at the same time will ensure no interruption of service and maintain consistent climate control for students and staff. We'd like to use to contract with Unitech Mechanical, who by the way is a local Chandler company, for the replacement of the chillers at Hull Elementary in the amount of $491,397.75. The district would utilize a job order contract via 1GPA, which complies with all school procurement rules. Recommend approval of Unitech Mechanical to re replace chillers two, three, and four at Hull Elementary in the amount of $491,397.75. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Could I please get a motion? Lindsay, I know you're having technical difficulties, so we'll have to have someone else <laughs> make a motion. I'll move it. Second. Are there any questions? So these are three for less money. I'm assuming they must be having a smaller capacity. They are smaller. Okay. So the ones at Hamilton High School are approximately 360 to 370 tons. The ones at Hull are 390 ton and 180 tons. We are upsizing them though to have four 100 ton units. This is also 2019 bond? That is correct. Are there any other questions? Mr. Olive or Ms. Love? Nope. No questions. No. Nope. Okay. All those in favor of approving Unitech Mechanical to replace chillers two, three, four, um, at two, three, and four at Hull Elementary in the amount of $491,397.75, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. And Mr. Fletcher, the last one is yours. Also, architectural and engineering fees for Castile High School tennis courts and concessions building. Madam President, members of the board, due to land restrictions when Castile High School was built, we were only able to build four competition tennis courts, which typically we would have built eight. With the growth at Castile High School and having six grade levels, the district believes it's necessary to build eight additional tennis courts concessions, restrooms, and storage on the vacant property lo located immediately north of the current sand volleyball complex. 
The estimated construction cost of this project is between 3.7 to $4 million. The architect of record for Castile High School is HDA Architects. We have received a design fee proposal in the amount of $170,625, which represents 4.6% of the estimated construction budget and is very reasonable in the current market. Recommend approval of HDA Architects to provide design for the tennis court and concession project at Castile High School in the amount of $170,625. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Could I please get a motion? Uh, Madam President, I move um, item 7.03, the architectural and engineering fees for Castile High School tennis courts and concession building, totaling the amount of 107. I'll second. <laughs> Sorry, were you in the middle of that? That's okay, no problem. <laughs> $170,625. Thank you. And, Ms. and Lindsay, you seconded. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sometimes the, our microphones just don't pick up really well. So, all right. Are, are there any questions? Oh, uh, yes. Mr. Fletcher, the SFB requires a certain amount of tennis courts, doesn't it? Is part of the construction like basketball courts and so forth? No, because it's considered athletics, but they do, can, they do require PE basketball. Not, not tennis courts? No. I guess I'm a little confused as why this happened. If there was vacant land available, why didn't we get it? We didn't it have the time? vacant land at the time we built that complex. So what vacant land did you end up buying then? We bought the 9.8 acres on the east side of Ivy Road, which is about maybe an eighth of a mile from... Is that, is that what you put the parking on to? I'm sorry? Is that part of the land for parking? Yes. OK. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other questions, Mr. Olive or Ms. Love? Madam, no Madam, questions from me. Madam President, I just want yes, to Mr. Narducci. explain a little bit about the sand volleyball courts. Those are not just Castile, but those are utilized by other district, other That's high schools. That's a district complex, well. correct. So they'll have use of this facility, too, because it's going to be between the tennis courts and the sand volleyball courts. That is correct. So they'll be able to use the, the concession area, the restrooms that are a part of this. So it, it actually extends outside of just Castile's use. Correct. But our other high schools, if they're utilizing those volleyball courts, would be able to utilize it as well, correct? Correct. Are there any additional questions, comments? Mrs. Bruner, did you? You can ask my question again, bond 2019? Correct. And Mr. Worth, just to clarify, if you go back, we purchased 32 acres originally. Then we purchased 19 and a half acres at Castile. Then we purchased 12 and a half. And then we purchased 9.8. So when we did the original master plan, we didn't have all of the acreage that we have today. Is that because of a lack of funds or? Lack of land availability at the time. A lack of people willing to sell it. There must have been land there. Correct. <laughs> okay. And um, uh, Castile already has um, some tennis courts. Could you explain what's going to be done with those and how it's going to be worked out? So originally when we built the four tennis courts, we built them with basketball standards on it. We took the basketball standards off because they felt it was interfering with the competition tennis. So we will now go back and put the basketball standards back on those four tennis courts, and they will become PE basketball courts. Mr. Narducci, did you have wanted to say add something? Yeah. Also, I mean, he's exactly right. I mean, Mr. Fletcher knows his stuff. But the other, the other thing is that we got to remember we have a junior high campus there and a high school. Both are playing tennis too, so it'll be their option whether they want to use those four, four courts also for uh, different types of practicing for their junior high team as well. Um, as having the additional courts, but they cannot get through a game right now um, in the high school division uh, before the sunlight goes away. So it's it's a it's very difficult to do it on four courts, and those were multi-use courts. So they'll go back to being multi-use for PE and 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 to help them with the junior high and the high school being on the same campus. And Mr. Narducci, Narducci is correct. So a typical varsity tennis competition has five single matches and three doubles. So try to get those through on four courts is a challenge. Now, will these have um, 
uh, nighttime lighting? Will not. Will not. Okay. So we don't have to worry about those um, light trespass on people's property out there. Correct. Great. All right. Are there any other questions? All those. Uh, so we'll no. go ahead and. Oh yes, Mr. Olive. No, no, I was saying no. Oh, okay. Um, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor of um, approving HGA Architects to provide the design for the tennis court and concession project at Castile High School in the amount of $170,625, please say aye. 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 Mr. Olive, we didn't hear you. Oh, I was waiting for abstain. Abstain? Okay. Thank you. The motion carries um, 4-0-1, well, abst one abstention. Now we'll go on to our student activity, auxiliary operations, and tax credit reports. Um, I believe Mrs. Berry is in charge of that one. Madam President, members of the board, the student activities, auxiliary operations, and tax credit reports for the months ending July 21st through December 21st are provided for your review. Now you're going to see a number of negatives in a, in a and a bunch of the different accounts. And part of that is, for an example, at one of our schools there was a tournament. We're still collecting the fees from the schools that participated at the tournament. And there's other things that we're collecting um, as outstanding revenue. So we have each one of those outlined. If you ever want a list of that and what we're doing to reconcile that, we can give that to you. But it's just part of being part of the middle of the year um, with revenues that are coming in based on the events that are taking place. Thank you. Welcome. Are there any questions for Mrs. Berry? Okay, um, we will then go to our private day tuition expenditures. Dr. Gilbert. Madam President, members of the board, the list of private day school tuition expenditures for the second quarter of the 2021-2022 school year are provided for your review. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Gilbert? Um, Dr. Gilbert, I do have one question. I see that our quarter two expenses um, have uh, increased quite a bit, and um, uh, compared. And when I look at the remaining amount, um, do you anticipate that we are going to need to authorize additional funds for this uh, particular category? Um, I do not. I I had the same question when I was looking at the numbers, and one of the things that I'm I've learned as I've taken over this area is that we always are in the rears when we pay, and so it does not come up on the sheet until we actually pay it. So we are, we are actually fine on course of where we are, but I did mention um, in our last board meeting or when I talked about quarter one that we have seen increase in cost, um, although um, from what we've seen in the past just this year with, with what we're paying in fees, but I think we are on, on track with what we have um, asked for in, in this um, budget. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Gilbert? Okay, we will now move on to our board agenda roadmap. Our next meeting um, is going to be January 26th. And um, I believe, Dr. Nance, you're going to be talking about some of our, is that correct, um, some of the portrait of a CUSD graduate. And we're going to talk about um, some of those things that we are expecting to have our graduates um, um, have learned and have achieved and what kind of characteristics they have. Uh, is that correct? Okay. And it looks like we'll have a Prop 301 pay for performance public hearing by Dr. Gilbert. Are there any other comments on the roadmap? If not, um, Mr. Narducci, do you have comments for this evening? Sure. Um, Madam President, members of the board, community members, uh, we have a, th a few things for you tonight. But first, I want to thank our, our board members for, uh, for their service. Um, this is the month for, to recognize our board members. So um, we did that a little bit tonight with your certificates because we could not do the things we're doing without your approval. Although we have differences of opinions at times and thought processes are in different places, your hearts are all in the right place to move student achievement forward and I appreciate each one every one of you for doing that and 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 for overcoming obstacles to make sure that that gets done that all of our ch children achieve also want to thank our community um, we had a little uh, social media blitz out there to acquire more substitute teachers um, we've been working very hard as a team 
and that's what we do uh, to cover when we want to keep schools open. And our team is, everybody is chipping in. Our teachers are doing a wonderful job as well. But I just want to um, st thank our community because um, they, they have turned in over 100 applications to ESI, who works with our hiring of our substitute teachers, 100 applications. When we were at 43, um, Dr. Nance was told by ESI uh, that that was the most applications they've ever gotten for one school district. When they hit 100, they said, what are you guys doing out there? So I want to thank our community. I know there's many members in here. I know Kurt Rohr has signed up to, to do that. I appreciate when people help us solve problems. Um, it's one thing to bring up a problem, but it's another to help us get in there, jump in there, and help solve it. And I do appreciate those that have, have signed up. For others, if you'd like information, you can call Dr. Nance's office, or we can get you the information directly. And I believe it's on our website as well. Uh, but we, um, we, we, we appreciate having uh, the ability to have our community come into our schools and help us um, when we are a short substitute teachers. We have a great pool of substitute teachers, and we couldn't do it without them. Um, also, our staff. Um, everybody is working hard from our every department. Um, this is something very different for all of us, right? Some of the same for the last two years, but our peaks and valleys are always different, and I don't think any of us, any of us um, have determined how things are going to go and where they're going to go. But I do want to thank our staff. Our staff has been diligent. They have been steadfast. They're covering for each other. Our, our students um, are supervised, and, and learning is continuing. Our goal and our priority is to keep schools open and for our schools to be working with kids. And so I want to thank our, our staff um, who have done that tirelessly uh, for the last year and a half, uh, but especially now because we have a a heightened uh, awareness. Um, so again, if you get an opportunity um, to thank a staff member, to send a message to a staff member of encouragement, it means a lot right now. And so I would appreciate doing that. I know our staffs have done some transportation bus driver appreciation celebrations. Uh, those people have tough jobs, and, and uh, they're doing a good job. We have not had um, major delays. Uh, what we do do is we'll notify the parents if a route is being delayed. Uh, we are suffering no difference than anyone else. As a matter of fact, um, our routes are pretty much for as big as we are going pretty well. So I have to give that as a positive. So where we have a delay or a route has to be doubled back to pick up, we'll notify parents. So look for your text or your email message because we'll, we'll let you know every morning if that's going to happen. Uh, our goal is to keep buses running and to get keep students coming to school on time. Um, I have a few things for you tonight, and I apologize for the length of this, but we haven't seen you for a while. Um, first, I'd like to start with the status report on the COVID mitigation um, activities and initiatives. Um, I was part of the National Superintendent's virtual meeting with Secretary of Education Cardona recently where emphasis on keeping schools open across the nation was stressed. Uh, we support schools being open and, and know it's best for our students to be in school, and it's the safest place for our students to be is in school. However, I'm asking our community to work with us in this effort. Uh, the viral spread is real. Impacts are felt not only in our community, but in other, our districts, at our district as well as every other district across the state of Arizona. Regardless of the mitigation plan, they're all experiencing the same pieces right now. What, what can you do to help keep schools open and limit the impacts to individuals? Well, first, acknowledge that although individuals are impacted differently, that there is an increase in positive cases in our community. Mitigations are important, and we have adjusted our plan based on recommendations at both the national and local agency, um, as well as input from our community. And in order to address the concerns shared by our community regarding our COSD quarantine guidelines, we have implemented the following to reduce the number of students who are healthy, um, but not in school. Unvaccinated non-symptomatic students now can return and wear a mask for 10 days or wear a, a mask for five days and return with a negative test after day five. These have been sent out. Uh, that's, that's a Maricopa County of Public Health who is still tied to that initiative. Uh, vaccinated non-symptomatic students will continue to attend school. That's also Maricopa County Public Health. Uh, students with a positive COVID test were required to isolate at home for a minimum of 10 days. Um, can now, based on CDC recommendation and county, isolate themselves for five days at home or return to school after five days as long as the following conditions are met. And this was sent home in the letter. Students, a student is not exhibiting any symptoms after five days and has been fever-free over 24 hours without the use of fever-reducing medication. 
a student is required to wear a mask for a remaining five-day period. That's required, not recommended. Um, that is what we have to do. So the conversation takes place with the parent and the student. Upon notification, we do expect them to adhere to that. If a student doesn't and has to be asked about it, then their 10-day quarantine will be impacted. When established thresholds are met, our plan provides for addition mitigation for the identified site. We'll notify families if that was to occur. The increased mitigation is nothing new. It has been listed on our website all year and will be reduced when the number of positive cases drops below the threshold. The thresholds are listed on our website for a minimum of five days and holes for five days. So once that happens, then we'll go back to allowing the additional pieces. Believe me, there's nothing more than we'd like to do than these cases to go away and open schools with as much normalcy as possible and, and have schools um, operational as with normalcy, meaning we don't have high absences. We strongly recommend wearing uh, masks and being aware of COVID-related symptoms prior to sending your child to school. Um, it's important for reducing the community spread. Help us keep our schools open for children and, and staff. Uh, it's community spread, important to understand, it's community spread that is impacting schools. It's not school spread impacting our communities. And so with that, we need to do our best to be, have diligence out there when we're doing that so that our schools can stay open. Knox Gifted Academy, Lynn Weed and Arizona College Prep High School uh, Principal um, Rob Bickus learned recently that they've been named semifinalists for the Maricopa County Exemplary Principal Award. This is quite an honor considering there are 1,200 principals in the county. We wish them luck moving forward in the process, which includes a video conference and interview, and so we'll let you know as soon as we hear that. Both exceptional leaders and uh, and we're very proud of them. Over the weekend at Hamilton High School, they won, I'm sorry, over the weekend Hamilton High School won the We the People State Championship. Uh, the Citizen and the Constitution program promotes civic competence and responsibility among the nation's upper elementary and secondary students. The We the People curriculum is an innovative course of instruction on the history and principles of the United States Constitution. The program enjoys active support from the Arizona State Bar Association, and we want to congratulate our Husky students and their coach, Abby uh, Dupke. Senior uh, uh, Dana Son, member of the Chandler High School Modaz Dance Company, won the Arizona Department of Education's Dance Essay Con Arizona Department of Education's Dance Essay Contest for her essay "Movement as a Motivator." Um, Dana um, received a mon monetary prize and a congratulatory letter from the Arizona Department of Education, and will have her essay displayed on the. Uh, Arizona Department of Education website for a year. So we want to congratulate uh, Dana on that. And I also probably should take advice of this m movement as a motivator. I think that would <laughs> keep us all healthy. Um, four CUSD teachers earned their National Board of Certification in December. Uh, we're very proud of them as well. This is an extreme amount of effort. Courtney Cook from Rice Elementary, Wendy Defoe from Riggs Elementary, Allison Ekrin from Basha Accelerated Middle School, and Christy Willick from Ryan Elementary. Um, this process is, is, is pretty arduous. It's one of the highest certifications that we can uh, give our teachers. Um, our, um, our, we also have four uh, teachers who received um, their, uh, their research, and uh, that's uh, jo Jolene Gallup from San Marcos Elementary School, Katie Nall from Basha High, Lily Chen from Hamilton High, and Amy Spildy from the Instructional Resource Center. National Board Certification was designed to develop, retain, and recognize accomplished teachers and to generate ongoing improvement in schools nationwide. It is the most respected professional certification available for our K-12 teaching certifica certifications. And um, we also have the 2022 Winner's Choice Car and Cash Raffle that has just begun. Uh, Chandler Ed Foundation has released their raffle tickets. So any CSD uh, can, school can provide those um, during the month of January to be eligible for the early bird drawing on February 2nd. It's a $20 ticket and a chance to win lots of money, $27,000 off the MSRP of a new Toyota through Big Two Toyota, which is, we've had a great partnership with, um, or 20000 in cash. So if they take the cash versus the car, that's 20000 So 
the bigger part of this is that it supports our students and our staff and uh, initiatives of our district. We thank Chandler Ed Foundation for being our partner. And just a reminder that Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. holiday uh, day for the district and our districts will be closed in observance. This holiday provides an opportunity to reflect on ways we can strengthen our communities, bridge our barriers, address social challenges, and move us closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community as we honor his life work. Uh, we, um, the, associ the associated um, with the holiday, we understand that our own uh, uh, Adama Salu, Dr. Salu, has been nominated for the City of Chandler's 2022 Martin Luther King Jr. Keeping the Dream Alive Award, which will be presented on Friday afternoon. I will be in attendance uh, for that event. And so we congratulate uh, Dr. Salu as well. And uh, just to remind parents that Monday schools are closed in observance of, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And that's, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Narducci. Do any board members have any comments? Let's start with Jason. Hey, good evening. Um, yeah, I wanted to say just a couple things. One, uh, a serious thank you to bus drivers uh, because they're the ones holding us all together right now, apparently. Um, and then also to, to teachers and everybody else. Um, but one thing that, that may help teachers is uh, one thing we need to talk about is the um, the clarity around um, what to do when your child has COVID? Um, we got the rules and everything, and and we got that in an email, just like all the other parents did. But it took us a couple of reads to to really understand what we needed to do. So maybe a little bit more communication on uh, on what exactly to do. Uh, you know, how, how how long somebody has to stay out, when they need to wear a mask, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that would that would help out a little bit. That was all I had to comment on. Thank you, Mr. Olive. Uh, Ms. Love? I don't have any comments tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Bruner? So, Mr. Narducci's 20-minute uh, long <laughs> update on, included some of my things, but I am going to overlap on one if I could be permitted. I also wanted to congratulate the teachers who earned their national board certification. Um, uh, my, the, the area that I teach, psychology, does, does not allow for it, but I've known other folks who have um, earned theirs, and the amount of work people are like, this was like three times the work of getting my master's. You know, <laughs> It's very um, comprehensive, and it involves lots of videotaping of what you do and analyzing and looking at data, and um, so, so kudos to them. And I especially want to give a shout out to Courtney Cook, who was my student in my classroom and now is a national board certified teacher at Rice. So congratulations, Courtney. Um, I also um, did want to mention that um, if possible, I would like to have on the next board meeting um, an item regarding um, the situation with paraprofessionals. Um, I monitor the site of when we're posting jobs. And in the last couple months, we've had many, many, many postings for paraprofessionals. And when I talk to people at the sites, it's definitely one of those jobs. It doesn't quite get the publicity that the, the bus drivers do because obviously you can kind of make things work when a paraprofessional's not there. When the bus driver's not there, the bus can't drive itself. But they are just as vital to the needs of um, our elementary classrooms, our classrooms with students with special needs and other places that we use our paraprofessionals. And I was hoping that we could hear about um, possibilities of what we can do to actually attract. And I know that um, Ms. Nance um, has been working hard in many aspects of HR um, this year and last year and really forever because <laughs> schools are always tough um, financially to be competitive with industry. But um, possibly looking at some groups we can reach out to and um, if we could, I know the salary schedule is a big deal, um, but that might be something that we could take a look at um, just so that we can have kids get their needs met um, because we do have a lot of kids with special needs and teachers in special education who are really struggling right now without them. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Worth, anything? Uh, yes, as part of the roadmap, um, I would like to see us do an update on where we are with the marketing program before the budget is adopted. And uh, also I'd like to have somewhere on the roadmap 
later in the year because I think there's more important items is to relook at all our evaluation process for non-teachers. I'd like to have a part of the roadmap for a discussion on that. <clears throat> no hurry on that, though. <clears throat> Would this also include administrators and? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think the law is pretty specific for teachers. It is not in the other categories. Okay. I'm, I don't really have much to say other than um, I'm looking um, forward to being able to re reflect this uh, weekend over the holiday weekend of, uh, with Dr. Martin Luther King Day. And um, I wish everybody um, a good weekend. And we will see you again in two weeks. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>